Hello, everyone. I'm Anna. I work at Eyes of Allend as a software engineer. Uh, I work there on, well, on observability, widely speaking. Um, and uh, we work on tools, uh, observability tools, using EBPF directly and indirectly. Um, EBPF, it's, well, EPF is not new. It's a technology that has been here for, here for a while. It's used in production for a while. And it has it got a lot of traction already in observability space and in wider cloud native space. Uh, but it is a technology that most of us use indirectly only through user interfaces of various tools. So it's still causes uh, a lot of confusion, misunderstanding. Uh, when I talk to people about eBPF, I see a lot of that. But this question, what is eBPF? Pretty basic question is, is still asked uh, pretty often. So let's start with a quick introduction. What is eBPF and what I will talk about today? eBPF is uh, a technology, a te technology uh, that, in short, uh, makes the Linux kernel programmable. It is the commonly used comparison is that eBPF is to Linux kernel what JavaScript is to the browser. So it allows you to kind of inject programs into Linux kernel, uh, run them without modifying the uh, Linux kernel itself, without recompiling it, etc. Uh, now, how it looks like. Uh, here we have a simple diagram. Um, normally, would software engineers write code running in user space, and yeah, most applications will just run in user space, but practically all code that anybody writes, anything, any tool that does something, relies on kernel on operating system to do a ton of stuff. And by a ton of stuff, I mean really a lot. Uh, this is usually done via syscalls. So the application calls, system calls to ask kernel to do things on its behalf, uh, like um, file operations, open, read, write a file, network calls, uh, various uh, other management things like running processes and um, resource management, things, things like that. Uh, this happens a lot. I, I think most engin engineers, from what I see, kind of realize, but not, not fully, how, uh, how much this has to happen. Like even simple operations, like opening a file, usually mean like 100 system calls or, or something like that. Mm, and with eBPF, uh, we can inject something into the kernel space, inject some code that will be automatically run on certain events. So when something happens in kernel, our eBPF program will run. eBPF programs are written usually in C, recently also in Rust, but because Linux kernel is written in C, this traditionally um, EBPF programs uh, will be written in C. And um, they get attached to these events. What are these events? Uh, let's talk about that. So EBPF programs can be attached to uh, many different events. In observability context, there are a few that are uh, most important, I would say. First, um, K probes and K red probes from kernel probes. These are basically function calls inside Linux kernel. So Linux kernel defines functions and they get called, right? Uh, similarly for U probes and U red probes, uh, these are functions in user space. So these are events that mean that um, yeah, some user space function got called. Uh, U red probe will be similarly uh, similar uh, event, but when the function returns. Uh, perf events. 
uh, these are interesting ones. So Linux kernel has this built-in profiler, perf. Uh, it's been there for uh, forever, <laughs> for, for a really long time, uh, tool used very commonly to gather uh, system-level data. Um, and it is used pretty commonly these days by various user space tools to uh, do something with this performance data that we have from, uh, from Perf tool. Uh, another uh, event the commonly used in observability are uh, trace points and user space trace points, so-called USDTs. Uh, these are very similar to K-probes and uh, U-probes. The difference is that uh, trace points are statically defined, same like user space trace points. What means two things, basically? means that they are more, more stable than K-probes and U-probes because function names can change between different versions, right? Um, trace points are considered more stable, but also there is, they have to be statically defined, so there's like a limited number of them. There are many, many more um, attachment points for eBPF programs, uh, like for example, socket events used commonly in networking or in security space, but from the observability perspective, uh, these are, I think, the, the most important ones. And um, this is when the eBPF programs are run. Now, to be actually useful, any program, computer program doing anything, uh, needs something to store its state. Like user space applications typically will connect to a database where the whole state of the world is stored in the database. In eBPF world, the role of the database is, um, is served by BPF maps. BPF maps is, uh, are basically key value stores stored in kernel memory. They, there are many different kinds, like really many different kinds of BPF maps. For example, hash, table, perfing buffers, but many others, but all are basically key value stores. And they can store some state of, um, of the world. Uh, they are used um, for communication between different components. And uh, this, th this sounds obvious uh, when, uh, when you realize that, but, but I think that um, it's important to, uh, to, to use eBPF for observability. Um, you can't really uh, just run something in, uh, in the kernel and that's it you need to communicate that to user somehow, right? This is what BPF maps are used for, for communication between kernel space and user space. So both kernel um, code, BPF code running inside the kernel and user space application can use same maps and communicate with, with each other that way. And also uh, BPF maps are used to commun for communication between different uh, BPF programs, for example, attached to completely different events uh, so that we can observe not only that, well, something happened in the kernel, but we can analyze in eBPF program what happened and gather this data from uh, different events. All right, so that was a short introduction to eBPF. Um, last, last thing uh, I wanted to show about it. Um, it would be a verifier. So this, this whole concept of running things in Linux kernel is not new at all. There are kernel modules uh, which allow that for quite a while. Um, we, what makes eBPF different is the verifier that ver well, verifies that the program is safe to run. By safe to run, uh, we usually mean that it's guaranteed to complete and it won't access memory that it shouldn't access, and a few other things like that. But basically that it won't crash the, ker the kernel, 
what is uh, a risk with, uh, with kernel models? Uh, people are generally often pretty scared about uh, just uh, installing kernel modules to, to the Linux kernel because well, if a kernel module contains the bug, then not just the program crashes, the whole machine crashes. The crashes. So that would be very bad. With BPF, this is not, uh, not really a problem because not really a worry because um, all the code is um, verified by a verifier and uh, then only then run. All right. Mm, so, why EBPF is useful for observability uh, and especially in cloud native space? Well, here at KubeCon, we uh, we run things in Kubernetes, right? Um, I, I run a lot of stuff in Kubernetes for quite a while. And well, in Kubernetes, we have many applications running on same node. They are scheduled by Kubernetes. As the dev developer, we don't really need to care which machine the application is running. We, it's just scheduled and then rescheduled by Kubernetes. Um, this is great from resources perspective, from management perspective. Um, but one thing that uh, that still remains the same is that although there are many applications running on any host and we don't need to care which applications are running where, still one node, one host has always one Linux kernel. And this Linux kernel, oh, by the way, I'm always saying Linux kernel. This can be, could be uh, Windows, though. The EVPF can, uh, is supported in Windows to these days. But let's stick to, to, to this assumption that, um, uh, that everything is running on Linux kernels. Mm. So all these applications running on one node uh, reach out to Linux kernel to do things, to make network calls, to open files, to uh, run processes, everything. And that means that um, if, um, if we put EVPF programs in this Linux kernel, they see everything that happens to all these applications. While we don't need to do any code changes in applications themselves, we need to have some code in user space that will load these eBPF programs, but no code changes to applications themselves. Uh, while eBPF programs can see practically everything. Um, one thing that makes it so promising in observability space is that there is well, one thing is that there are no code changes, but second thing is that there is very low performance overhead in all of that. Uh, EBPF programs run in kernel space, and of course, there is this kernel user communication happening all the time, but we don't need to uh, run everything in, in user space. We don't need to do that many calls to, to kernel if we do some of our observability logic in the kernel space. So this is uh, why people in observability space often get uh, so excited about PBPF and uh, why it's so, so promising because, well, observability, uh, instrumenting for observability always adds this overhead that nobody likes. Okay. Um, let's move on to look at uh, some of EBPF observability tools. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, most people won't write EBPF code themselves. Uh, it's C code. It's not a language that um, many people are really feel super comfortable with. Uh, it's code running 
in the kernel to load it, you need high privileges. Uh, these days, there are many, many tools that use eBPF for security, for networking, and also for observability. So let's take a look at some of these tools available today. First thing I wanted to show is this. And uh, I, this is a diagram that I think uh, appears in probably like 80% of talks about EBPF, maybe I exaggerated, OK, maybe half. But uh, a diagram that um, those of you who, uh, who are tracking this space probably saw a lot. Uh, it's the, the author of the diagram is Brendan Gregg. Um, and it shows various tools um, from so-called BCC, BPF Compiler Collection, a set of tools that uh, for um, monitoring many, many different things in, in Linux kernel. So we have uh, networking tools, we have uh, monitoring of user space applications, uh, resources like memory and storage, uh, a lot of them. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, all of all of these tools are available in the uh, BCC repository. Uh, this screenshot is a screenshot from like the uh, GitHub page of um, of this repo. It's just very small uh, subset of the tools because the list is very very long. Uh, by the way, if somebody w wants to learn eBPF or try out, I would, I can highly recommend to take a look at this code, at these tools, because each of these tools is just two or three files. They are pretty small, pretty self-contained, and they cover a lot of many various things, like networking resources, everything. So uh, yeah, great, uh, great examples for, for somebody who wants to learn eBPF. Um, now, there is this eBPF exporter tool from Cloudflare, which uh, how they describe it is BCC tools as Prometheus metrics, and that summarizes it pretty well. This is a tool that can uh, expose everything monitored by BCC tools as Prometheus metrics. Um, how it looks like, you uh, have to provide a configuration file. In the configuration file, you define what metrics you want, and what labels you want on these metrics. Uh, this is uh, pretty much necessary with any observability tools using eBPF, because the, the thing about eBPF is that it produces completely ridiculous amount of data. And uh, we need to define this pretty granularly what, what we actually want from it. And um, here on the slide, you can see the eBPF code that is generated from, um, from this config file. So it uh, basically uh, creates like a trace point, um, attaches to a trace point that um, will uh, count timers fired. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is uh, something that we work Mm, the main project of, uh, of Isa Valen, the company I work at, Cilium. Cilium is this eBPF for networking. It's a Kubernetes CNI plugin, a very uh, rich uh, CNI plugin. It also has uh, service mesh and other meshes, features, a lot of security enforcement. But this is not a talk about security um, and about networking. Cilium also has um, observability layer. And this is. Uh, Use, this is uh, using eBPF for observability sort of indirectly because, well, Cilium is using eBPF for networking. So instead of doing networking traditionally uh, with IP tables, we inject eBPF programs that handle network flows in Linux kernel. But if you have these eBPF programs that do that, then you can as well just ask these ABPF programs to, to provide you information uh, about what network flows are flowing in the system and observe that. So this is what Hubble does. Hubble is observability layer for Cilium. Um, Hubble provides a CLI that allows you to query all network flows with uh, many, many, many different filters. 
and also uh, if you prefer an aggregated view, you don't want you don't need that much um, granularity, then Hubble exposes Prometheus metrics that uh, can be in, ingested in, um, can be queried from um, Grafana, for example, here's Grafana screenshots where yeah, you, uh, you just query the network traffic from various different uh, network layers, uh, like in, with regular Prometheus metrics. Um, Another thing, uh, like kind of a project under the Cilium umbrella, is Tetragon. Tetragon is security tool. It is a um, tool that mostly security people would be interested in, people who need to do audits, for example, or want to detect attacks. Um, Tetragon uh, uses k-probes and trace points to monitor events that happen in the kernel. Uh, to use it, uh, you define tracing policy. Here you, have, see, you can see an example of a tracing policy. And what, what we can see here, uh, we see that the tracing policy defines k-probe that the program will attach to. Um, the k-probe is fde install. This is a Linux kernel function that um, basically what will be called uh, on file operations, roughly speaking. And the tracing policy also defines um, what, we, what output we want to get. In that case, we want to get um, file operations that happen uh, inside the etc folder. And uh, if we inject that uh, to to the Linux kernel, to the program generated um, with, with this config, then we can get this output from, from Tetragon, so we get very granular, like very granular events uh, that are happening inside the Linux kernel. In this case, we see that, uh, I think, it basically somebody writes a password, changes a password. Uh, as we can say it's not just one event, but in, from Linux kernel perspective, this is like there is some process started, then file is, is opened, then write, then closed, then exit. So, so there are a few operations out there happening around it. All right. Um, moving on from uh, security space, one thing that is pretty hot in observability space these days is uh, continuous profiling. Um, Earlier today, um, Frederick had a talk about uh, profile formats, and um, here uh, we can see a screenshot of uh, the icicle graph from, from Parka. Uh, there are a few of these continuous profilers uh, using eBPF these days, Parka, uh, Pixie, Pyroscope. They work in pretty different ways, but um, what uh, I, want, I, I looked at the code of, uh, of these tools, and, uh, well, this is the code. This is the eBPF code of, from, uh, from Parka. It is heavily truncated to fit it on slide, uh, but at the bottom you can see uh, inside there, there are links to, uh, for, to the full file. And, uh, well, this is some code. It's, uh, I guess, barely readable for you, so let's put some arrows on it. Um, what we can see in this code is um, it defines the profile CPU function. Uh, this profile CPU function uh, takes as an argument uh, uh, some, some struct. This struct is defined in Linux kernel headers, and uh, this will be struct that is passed to, uh, to, to our event. Then there is some reading from BPF map and uh, writing to a BPF map and helper function that uh, basically is, is, is called to, um, to gather all this data uh, to, to form a profile. Um, now, this, this is some BPF code. Uh, to actually use it, it needs to be loaded into uh, the Linux kernel from user space. And this is 
code that uh, that does it. Uh, the Parka user space Go code. Uh, again, probably uh, very truncated and probably barely readable, but what is important here is that um, Parka uses this uh, libbpf go uh, library from Aqua Security, the Go library for um, operations on libbpf programs. And uh, we can see that this code basically uh, defines um, the same profile CPU um, function, and then it attaches it to a perf event. So uh, previously, um, I, when I was going through um, through various attachment points, mentioned this uh, perf profiler in, in Linux kernel. Uh, this is what is happening here, basically. This is uh, we are attaching to uh, perf. Um, perf event events from, from the, the perf profiler and uh, and this function, the CBPF function from the previous slide uh, is run continuously to gather the, the full um, the profile. Another thing that is uh, pretty uh, pretty hot uh, in in the um, observability space these days is distributed tracing. Here's a distributed trace, a Jaeger screenshot. So we can see, uh, well, this is something that everybody wants. Um, but it's not easy to get because this for distributed tracing, you basically need two things, right? Like to export traces, this can be done somewhat automatically, but also you need to propagate context. This is not easy. To propagate context, uh, this is always like language specific. For some languages, there are um, uh, tools that do that automatically, but for other languages, this is really not easy. But there is a project. There is a project that uh, is very early, uh, a very early stage, um, under open, uh, open telemetry umbrella. There is Go Auto Instrumentation Project that is uses eBPF to do exactly that, to propagate trace context. So what we can see here is eBPF code. Again, let's put some arrows. We can see that it defines uprobes for Go gRPC functions. And then it uh, writes trace headers to a BPF map. And again, this is code that, uh, that this is code that does uh, automatic trace context propagation with eBPF, but it needs to be loaded into uh, Linux kernel somehow. So here is the Go user space Go code doing that. Um, it uses a different user space library, uh, Cilium eBPF library, to define this eBPF program in user space. Uh, here's, you can see that it uses um, eBPF um, annotations. And we are attaching the U probes, uh, the eBPF U probes to the eBPF programs to uprobes, um, which are Go gRPC functions. Okay, so uh, can we uh, eBPF everything? Yeah, one problem, do you remember this picture? One problem with eBPF is that, well, when user does an action, then kernel sees it, but kernel really sees it in very, very different way. Kernel sees like file operations, network connections, a lot of that kind of stuff. So yeah, observability with eBPF is challenging, mostly because eBPF doesn't have business context at all. It's not exactly technically impossible to give it this business, this business context, but it's not practical. Like we can't copying your whole database to a BPF map is not really practical at all. Um, eBPF observability is still young. Uh, like this is distributed tracing auto instrumentation is very promising, but very, very young to be honest, uh, but very promising. And the data volume can be, well, we had a few talks about scale of observability today. It's always large, but with eBPF, it can be not only large, it's, it can be really absurd. So uh, eBPF tools, tool, observability tools using eBPF generally have to be heavily configured to, to gather only data that you need. 
Okay, so here's a summary of what's possible today. Uh, with eVPF, uh, system metrics is no code changes, network and security visibility for sure with Serum and Tetragon and Hubble. Uh, continuous profiling too. There are a few of these profilers these days. And I really hope that distributed tracing auto instrumentation will, will mature in the next years because this is a really promising uh, space. What, and there is something already for that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to learn more, um, feel free to visit uh, eBPF.io. Um, there is also a book written by my colleague, Liz Rice, Learning eBPF. Uh, you can download it from Azevalent website, but there is also, uh, there will be book signing tomorrow if you want to grab a paper copy with an autograph. And that's it from me. Thank you very much.